The next item on the agenda is the keynote address. Sarah George, Secretary of 18, will welcome our keynote speaker, Vladimir Lucier. When we were deciding who would fit the bill as a keynote speaker for today's launch, we were looking for a distinguished and accomplished alumni, alumnus, ideally someone young enough to embody the hopes and dreams of the next generation, yet somebody whose voice could also resonate with five decades of alumni who have as a common heritage, no matter where in the world they are now, their time spent at one of the tertiary educational institutions on the morn. We believe that we found such a voice and such a person in Vladimir Lucian, po writer, poet, and critic. Amongst, within his career, Vladimir co-edited the anthology entitled Saint Lucie, Poems and Art of Saint Lucia, and was screenwriter for the documentary film, The Americans, which premiered in the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival in 2013. He has featured at a number of literature festivals around the world and served as writer in residence at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. His writing has won a number of awards. A team reached out to fellow local poet and playwright, Mr. Kendall Hippolyt. And these were a few words he had to say about Vladimir and his work. There's no pressing need to go into the details of his um, external arc as a writer. His astonishing win of the One Caribbean Media Focus Prize in 2015, his reflections in non-poetic writings on other writers and on social issues. What I most want to draw attention to is the thread that runs through his writing of the value of community. Some of his most compelling poems focus on persons who are seen first and last as members of a community, persons who have recognizable social roles and validity. His critiques have as their implicit reference and moral standard, a vision of a more whole, a more harmonious society. Literature for him, as far as one can judge from his writing, is not primarily a road of personal ambition. It's a supple instrument to keep holding up this vision of community and to help work towards it. So it's not surprising that he's agreed to talk to this grouping, which in essence is devoted to extending the community of the community college beyond the brief two or three years that each person spends here. So thanks, Kendall, for expressing so well the significance of Vladimir's work and whetting our appetite. So we want to hear more from the man himself. And now I'm going to hand over to Vladimir. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me very well? OK, um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an immense pleasure. Um, I immediately, as, as soon as I was asked to be the keynote speaker, there was no need to give it a second thought. Um, SCLCC was my alma mater as well as um, the place I've worked the longest for in my life. I think I, I um, worked there from 2013 up until 2019 when I left. Um, so um, the, 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 the keynote is really kind of talking about this stuff anyway. So I think I'll go directly into it. Uh, but I would, uh, you don't get to see this, but I, I called it, because I titled everything I do, uh, A Microclimate of Sentiment and Excellence. Um, and I also dedicate it um, to Solomon Ajiman, who was a staff member while I was there, was a teacher while I was there, and um, while I was out, um, passed away. I was told by someone, maybe someone more skilled in the area, it might have been um, Dr. Felix, who I shared an office with um, for some years, that the weather and the environmental conditions on the morn um, are in part due to the existence of what we call a microclimate. Um, what this means is that the morn 
possesses certain kind of environmental conditions semi-independent of places surrounding. In addition to this, the moon is distinguished um, from these places by the barracks that constitute the majority of school buildings at the South Arthur Lewis Community College, along with others which um, are not part of the college but seem to adorn it, um, like the buildings before the Greece Augustine building, or even the French cemetery um, a little way down the road. There are other things um, that seem to set this place apart, like the huge cannonball tree near the entrance to the institution, the Inniskilling Monument, the existence of graves on campus of our two Nobel laureates. We may take this existence of such facts as mere happenstance of no real significance as just a matter of where this institution happened to end up, a decision of a government minister or something of that sort. Be that as it may, the fact that it ended up there would not have left it untouched by the various characteristics of where it is, and it has been there for long enough. But the spot for this institution was also chosen before it was chosen to be the site of the island's chief tertiary institution. It was chosen as an um, uh, it was chosen by an army as an ideal spot to conduct the activities of defense of their territory. Now imagine this entire history of the place, its natural and social history. Imagine all of this history being absorbed into the place. And if you cannot do that, look right in front of you to see the ample evidence left of times past. The point is such things cannot be taken for granted. Would you be more willing to build your house upon a spot where previous houses had burned down repeatedly, whether mysteriously or, or, or explainably, or where a family that generation after generation produced geniuses once lived? In Suriname, a cousin of mine told me that before houses built on the new property, someone would trudge along the perimeter of the proposed building site with a calabash of water and they, without being part of any particular religion, they would pour water into the, onto the ground, seeking to appease that any negatively disposed energies in that area, showing their respect for the long history that this seemingly normal piece of land holds and the respect for it as a living entity, even though it does not resemble a human being, even though it does not speak back in the way that we speak, even if it seems like merely something dusty beneath our feet. Now, why am I saying all of this? I'm saying it because it begins there, a respect for things generally according, according them, even though we are destined to use or make use of them, the same respect we accord a human being. This may be why some of us were told to ask some plants for permission before picking their leaves. Um, it is not a matter of but the thing cannot even talk or, but that is just a plant. Is it just a plant or is it healing that you come to it for? So what part of it makes you use the word just dismissively toward it? Doesn't it grow? Can it not one day suddenly stop producing these healing leaves? So these opening paragraphs are not just to appease, but to also pay respect to and draw our attention to the environment we speak of in a particular way to focus our attention on our reality in a particular way. And having done that, you may join me on the journey of what I am seeing here today. Institutions are no different. They are just like these environments with their histories, even though the institution is what we may call invisible, but they are not invisible. Nothing is invisible really. If we are willing to truly see things, not from the reference point of arrogant human beings, but at more profound levels. Where is an institution visible? So Arthur Lewis Community College was not always called by that name, nor was it always located on the Mourn, though I think the Mourn is a fitting place for it. But all of us who attended it in its various it iterations may have similar things to say about it, even if there isn't a visible and physical spot that we could point to and say, this is the institution. Those who attended it in cast trees may point in one direction. Those who attended on the Mourn will point in another. And even still, those who attended it when part was located in the George Charles Secondary School may point to yet another. And those who attended in Viewfort may, may say another thing. But we can see through, we could see through feeling as well. 
we can speak informed by how and what we feel of the character of the institution. And in that way, we may have some similar things to say about it that will transcend any single physical or temporal existence, something that will last for generations. And the feeling that would inform that is the knowledge within us of what our experience was, an experience that stayed with us, a way in which the institution remains a piece of us. For that, for that is where true institutions reside and never leave within people. And this is what forms an alumni. An alumni is a constantly growing pool of people within which lies the special feeling knowledge and therefore power that this institution has imbued them with. A source of power that they knowingly or unknowingly return to at various points in their lives to assist them in various aspects of their lives. And this alumni, because the essence of it is stored within people and the knowledge they have gained through their experience does not end with the living, but includes those who have departed for they to have contributed to the pool of experiential knowledge, not just intellectual, that many people continue to draw from. Just as we draw on lessons our parents gave us, which they gained through experience, the best kind of knowledge. So as an institution, so Arthur Lewis is its own microclimate, its own prominent building within those that have come to experience it in whichever of its iterations, a microclimate that comes to form part of the character of those who carry the environment of the place with them. And all who carry hidden within them that mark of us Arthur Lewis Community College experience are its alumni, its descendants. And if we say that the institution is not a, not a visible, but is a living source of power within us, then there is nothing stopping those who have left us physically from continuing to contribute to it. They may not contribute new things being unliving, but they contribute what we may call the force of legacy, the knowledge that alumni contain of knowing that they walk through the same halls as someone who's finished and observable life was one of excellence. If I walked where such and such person walked, then what is stopping me from becoming like them and even more? What an incredible source of power. So all of us here are marked internally and carry within us something given to us, planted within us at both known and unknown levels. And it is a living thing, like everything is a living thing and a living thing with its own special character, its own microclimate that constitutes a resource we shall use for the rest of our lives and shall be of use to our grand and great grandchildren and will live even if the name Sir Arthur Lewis Community College were to vanish, vanish from the face of the earth and it will never. Now, I can speak of what my personal relationship to this entity has been. And I have had an experience of it at two levels, that of being a student and that of being a member of staff. Both of these are significant. When I attended Sir Arthur Lewis as a student, <clears throat> when my former schoolmates and I, as well as the new mates I was meeting because we were coming from different secondary schools, when we came here, it was common for people when writing or scratching the usual graffiti comprising of one's name and the years of attendance to not include the year they would complete studies. It was a kind of joke, but it was also very serious. The idea was that we were not sure that we were guaranteed to make it to the second year. So lofty were the expectations of our performance and we were not sure we could measure up. Also, it was, it was a time when, where you could get kicked out if you didn't measure up. So the idea was that we were guaranteed only our first year and that we would possibly be denied the kingdom of heaven of the second year. Some of us made it, some of us didn't. But this had personal resonance for me in a way that I could only account for now. If someone is to look back at my school records from secondary school to my first year at Sartha, they could judge by that, that I was quite content with mediocrity. Those who knew me a bit better would at best say that I had some potential, but when I got to SALCC in September of 2004, I had spent the better part of five years shirking the expectation of excellence that surrounded me on all sides. My family had been one of venerable people of great intellectual substance. They and others around me could tell there was something there and had doggedly maintained those expectations of excellence throughout my joking and fooling around. 
during that time, I sort of leaned on the fact that I knew I could do anything within myself, but never had the courage nor the fortitude to do what it takes to make that potential manifest. Many people can rely on such a fact. Oh, I know I am smart, even though B's and C's. In fact, I would say that this is 99% of all people, if not 100%, because we are all born with the capability to do just about anything no matter how much our limitations seem to be visible and pressing against us, the creative source of our origin, which lives within us, holds out the possibility of infinite potential within us. It's to me like a scientific fact. And it's just like that, that we hold SELCC within us. When I arrived at SELCC, I secretly mocked my teachers. In one class, I remember that it was difficult for me to stay awake. Uh, so difficult that upon being asked by the lecturer to stay up or leave, I was so incapable of staying awake that I humbly uh, admitted to her that I couldn't stay awake and therefore I should leave. One summer I was called in with my mother to Mrs. Modest's office, note it was summertime, about some excuses I had submitted to the class monitor to account for my absence for a very early class in OTW. In front of such self-respecting women, as my mother and Mrs. Modest, I had to explain to them the special syndrome I had called intense fatigue, which I had detailed in my excuses to the class monitor. My mother was not impressed. Mrs. Modest perhaps had long ceased to be. When my friend, who is now the MP for Grosely, Kenson Kazimi, was running for student council president, I opted to help his campaign by making humorous additions to the posters of his rival a job that earned me the right to fall asleep in the student's council's office, air-conditioned office from time to time, um, though this right was not given to me by Kenson. All of us at various points in our lives find ourselves very funny, find our nonchalance very funny, and even find some self-righteousness in dismissing challenges that come to us because they seem to be about other people when they are really opportunities for us to show our determination to be excellent to be more than our visible limitations suggest. We say we're only human as a way to let ourselves off the hook, sometimes as a fact we could lean on while the world passes us by. Human is only one aspect of what we are, perhaps the most visible, but what about such invisible and bottomless things like the potential we possess inside that are not reconcilable with the idea of human, but touch instead on the divine? Well, it may have been divine. It may have been from the power of the institution within us that I got the help I needed. In spite of all my excuses, my laissez-faire par excellence, I couldn't help but see that for whatever reason, there were people around me who still believed in me and who still were waiting to see me draw more from that bottomless source and less from the bucket of excuses and smugness I had carried around willingly with me as a way of explaining why I couldn't do more than I currently was. Rather than becoming my own special microclimate like my institution, I was content to be part of the general taken for granted climate of pure sunshine and permissible laziness. But Mrs. Modest, Mrs. Jean King Hippolyte, Mr. Kendall Hippolyte, Ms. Mrs. Lisa Dublin, Mrs. Perlene Jilks, Mr. Royston Emanuel, and many others were like these battlement walls that continue to stand guard on the morn long after war ceased to be part of St. Lucian reality. Like the walls of OTW or the VAR building, they stood in plain faced expectation of great height during my war with my deepest potential, waiting almost knowingly for it to end. I cannot say how much this meant to the complete 180 turn around that would take place in so many aspects of my life at the end of my first year at SALCC, at the end of which I felt I had hit rock bottom. But even after hitting rock bottom, it was like I woke up from being unconscious and saw all of these people, all of that legacy and the very air of Sir Arthur around me standing like walls that took it for granted that I was meant to do something more. And they seemed to do this from both something they saw in me, but also something they knew to be a universal fact about everyone. For like the walls of the school, they had seen the likes of such before. The expectation remained and was strong and tremendously empowering. That summer, I asked my mother to drop a subject I never should have been doing anyway, management of business. No offense to the teachers, it wasn't for me. Vowing that I would get A's in every single one of the remaining subjects. I am not sure where such confidence to make such a promise came from, but it brought together two things I had not brought together for years in my own life. 
the knowledge of my limitless potential and the commitment to work. And it is those walls that surrounded me, insisting that I actualize my own microclimate, my own special quality that allowed me to do so. Just sheer expectation of excellence. A barely B and mostly C student at Sir Arthur with a couple fails in CXC. I graduated from SCLCC with an A in general paper, an A in sociology, an A in literature and received the Jakes Compton Award for literature at graduation. It was at SCLCC in the second year as well that I began taking myself seriously as a poet, a career that would take me to places I never knew I'd see or certainly not that early in my life from India to Africa, Germany, Amsterdam, Canada, the US, et cetera. It was my second year of, S it was in my second year of SCLCC that I also became the first ever young arranger for uh, National Panorama. Um, my academic career thereafter continued in that vein and so did my career as a poet. And outside of these visible means, my attitude remains one that is galvanized by my awareness of these strong walls of expectation implanted in me by my experience at SALCC. These are not merely the expectations of particular people, but like this institution took over the war barracks of the British, I took over those walls and now look to myself and refuse to accept the mediocrity I had so willingly accepted before. I would like the rest of my life to be like my second year at SALCC, which now I can not only write down into my unfinished proverbial desk scratching, but I would not put 2006 as the end date. In fact, within me, I carry the markings, Vladimir Lucien, SELCC, 2004 hyphen, and that's it. There is no end, only newer and brighter beginnings and frontiers. The last thing I would like to say briefly is about my experience as a teacher from 2013 to 2019, which I think says something else about the excellence of the place. Um, during some of that time, after I had come from a stint as writer in residence in UE Jamaica, I was approached by Vice Principal Dr. Merle St. Clair Geese to help create something that would stimulate intellectual curiosity and conversation on campus, and generally to enliven the kind of energy, that kind of energy on campus. The, re the result of that was what was called the Uprising, um, Uprising, the Illumination Lecture Series, in which members of faculty, especially as well as members of the St. Lucian intelligentsia were invited to lecture on a topic of their choice from the areas of expertise. We curated carefully our choice of candidates, trying to strike a balance in various ways. On the team, um, and I'll mention the names, we had the vice principal, Ms. Dora Henry, Mrs. Natalie Jolie Fannis, Mr. Royston Emanuel, and Mr. Garvin, whose last name I've been trying to find out and have not been able to. Garvin, who works in the library, it's essential part of our team. Um, so teaching at SELCC to some degree was, um, oh, sorry, I was, uh, I, was, I was going to say growing up in St. Lucia as well, I, I should say that it was difficult for me to kind of embrace teaching. It was something um, you were taught that you did for a while and then you move forward. Um, teaching at SELCC to, at SELCC to some degree was um, prestigious, but teaching was always ranked in the mouths of others as something here, and then you had law and accounting and whatever else later on. Um, so I taught always setting my eyes on what I saw as something bigger or, or perhaps a better career. Anyway, in working with this team of persons, um, what I saw in them will affect me for the rest of my life and now constitutes part of the strong walls of expectation that I hold within me, that SCLCC in various ways has given me. What I saw in them was a level of commitment I had never seen before in whatever task it is they were assigned or volunteered to do. A level of commitment that invariably resulted in excellence, often both in the execution as well as in their mere character. So I, who considered myself in transit while teaching to another career, saw in my colleagues something I had forgotten the road to the dream and the tires or the soles on the feet of that intention, commitment. I can safely say that in every way I've been, I have never been around a group of people who impressed me and whose commitment touched me as much as the Illuminations team. And though it was usually myself or Natalie who got up on the podium to speak at the beginning of the lecture, the true makings of excellence resided at Royston's and Garvin's tech station at Dora's desks and notepads in Natalie's years of demonstrated and good-natured commitment to this institution. 
And we did this, they did this consistently, no matter how trickling the audience, no matter what mistakes were made in the previous lecture, no matter what resources we needed and didn't have. What you are and what all who are associated with this institution are, are makers of not so much human beings, but makers of something that pushes the envelope on our definitions of ourselves towards what limitations truly are, what our limitations truly are. They are non-existent. And as much as SALCC has provided walls of assurance and expectation, these walls have always encouraged those within it to transcend them, to break them down. In my last two years here as a there as a lecturer here there I guess I'm I'm in both. I also had a very enviable friend group with whom I had coffee every morning, who set very high expectations of what kind of coffee was allowed in the office, in a loving microclimate of mutual commitment that helped each of us in the most unassuming ways to carry on and face the various challenges that came our way in work and in life. Friends who I hold dearly still. This institution has given to me and many others walls of protection of high expectation and open spaces of constantly expanding possibility. And for that, as alumni, for those unseen and seen ways in which we have been empowered, we must demonstrate the commitment and the good character to nourish this source of power in the world that we secretly carry no matter where we are, the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you. <laughs>